we're so glad that each of you came this afternoon and to our Lost Skills program. This is our third program that we've had, and um, we have plans for it to just keep going. <laughs> There's so many things to learn. Um, <clears throat> and what I, the Lost Skills uh, program is building skills for a hope-filled future. You know, um, many skills have been lost through the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, so many times our grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever, you know, they used to do all this stuff all the time. And um, some of us have been fortunate enough that our parents kept it going. And then other people, I feel sorry, you know, they haven't learned it. So I just had a real burden that so many people, especially in this day and age, are needing some help to, and they're just begging for help to uh, know how to do some of these things. So um, the thing is about the development of uh, convenience foods and services like that, that all came uh, about when women had to go back to work and or go to work, you know, um, during the war and, and to keep things going. And then um, one thing is that that has um, this has led not only to our dependence on the system, but also has changed our lifestyle to be more unhealthy. Um, we eat more processed foods, and um, we get less exercise, which can lead to diseases that could be prevented. So uh, the, uh, these are the purposes of our lost skills, you know, that we gain uh, skills that will help make us more independent of convenient shopping and services, which we can do ourselves. Um, and... It can save money, bring families together. It really, really helps to bring the families together. They work together on their farm or in their garden, and the kids learn more um, about where their food comes. How many, how many kids don't know where their food comes from? <laughs> A lot of them. Okay, um, also gives the opportunity to teach the, our kids the skills and improve our health. <clears throat> so, you can see some of our uh, potential future topics. Um, foraging, no, I'm sorry, next month, May, is going to be bread making. And then in June, it's, it's the fourth Sunday of every month is when we're doing it, except in May, we're doing it the 21st, the third Sunday, because of Memorial Day weekend, okay? Um, but otherwise, it's a fourth Sunday of every month, and um, in June, we're going to be doing foraging. And, you know, that's trying, uh, looking for plants that um, are medicinal or edible or things like that. You know, they're all around us, and I'm going to be going out and looking for them to take pictures of them to make our advertisement. <laughs> I'm excited because I'll be able to find new things at home. Um, and so, you know, coming up, we have uh, several of these things, and at the end, you'll get um, the advertisement for next uh, month, which will have, you know, the schedule of what we're doing. Okay, and then, um, let's see, today's is, uh, we're going to be talking about gardening for sustainability, and you know what? We were all made to live in a garden. That's the way we were made, and um, to grow our own food. Now, Melody and I uh, love gardening, and we've learned a lot over the years. But, you know, it's not through our own efforts that we get the results of our garden. Of course, we learn a lot, and we put it into practice. But both of us have seen God's hand in our garden, you know, watching the way he created the, the plants and everything to grow and to uh, resist diseases or, you know, different things like that. And um, so 
I would like to ask uh, to have a prayer now and ask God to help us to be able to teach you well. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for the way you've created our world and, and even the plants um, and everything that you've created for us, for our enjoyment and also for our sustenance. And I just pray that you will help us as we learn more this afternoon, that um, you will help us to be able to express things clearly and that um, it will encourage people who would like to um, start a garden. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so I don't know any have any of you who were here last time um done anything did you start any plants or have you started anything done anything that we talked about last time Ruth Ann, you saw you yes you started some plants mhm mm yeah <laughs> i know i this last week i started some tomatoes and a couple of them are like that, you know, but I started lettuce, and you know what, that's about up like that, so um, it's it's going faster. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I started, I had this started just before the last program. This is a sweet potato, and um, if you can see there, only one of my sweet potatoes that i tried to start really put anything out but this is a new way of doing it for me um, putting some dirt in there and we talked about it last time and those of you who weren't here last time you can go online and you can watch the video just uh, look up uh, Edwardsburg SDA Church on YouTube and then it'll be the lost skills and it's right there <coughs> But I was excited because I had all this growth from last month. So um, Melody is going to show us how we, oh, first of all, let me do this real quick. Um, we're going to give you a lot of information, <laughs> and you do have a handout that has a lot of the information in there, too. And um, so I want you... If you want more information, uh, Melody has created a very long informational email, which we would love to send you if you'd like it. So we're going to be sending this around, and um, you can put your... Um, I should have gotten a... Laurel, can you get us a pen, please? Oh, she has one. Um this can go around and you can put your email and stuff. The only reason we would need your phone number is in case we got your email wrong. <laughs> right here. You demonstrate what we're talking about. Are you on? Um, am I on? Okay. 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 So, um, Melody is going to show us how we can make this into several slips and from what I was watching something last night and I think from this I could get almost a hundred pounds of sweet potatoes. You could. I mean almost you could get most of what you need right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's really going to town. So anyway we're going to get started here to show you how to make this into um into okay. slips. Go ahead. So I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about myself. I'm Melody Moratz, mm -hmm. and I love gardening. Like Martha, we're kind of discovering we're kindred souls here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've been doing it, <coughs> gardening, for more than 10 years now. Um, when I was a kid, I remember working in my parents' garden and really disliking the hoeing and the weeding. And if somebody had told me then that I would love gardening one day, I would have thought they were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up, you know, at the house we're at now, and I started with containers. You know, just it, the thing that got me into it, I bet you could guess. What plant do you think would get me into it? Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because you know there's nothing like a homegrown tomato. It makes all the difference. So I started with containers, 
And I'll just, uh, I don't know if I can show you. There's different kinds of containers that people use, but the kind I used is because I had a tendency to kill any plant in the house because I'd forget to water it, is the kind that have a reservoir. Have you heard of that before? Okay, so you can get these like at Lowell's or Home Depot, about $39 or so. You can get them smaller too. Um, and then this is a different kind, a grow box or earth grow box or something like that. Anyway, um, and that was pretty successful because, you know, they had water. I don't only have to water about once a week. And it was wonderful. They, they survived. <laughs> so that's how I started. And then I started experimenting. And um, I ended up with what I'm, I'm doing now. And, you know, every year is like... It's, it's, I feel like I'm a kid, it's like Christmas, and I'm like, okay, what am I gonna try this year? And okay, what didn't work last year? And you know, what did I wanna try new? And so, and you've got one season to get it figured out, you know, and, uh, and nowadays we have something extra fun, which is, you know, before it would have taken longer for Martha and I to learn, but now we've got YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it's like gardeners, hundreds of gardeners everywhere are experimenting, and many of them are experimenting with some ideas that we may have. So if I've had ideas that, I, that was going to be expensive and I've gone online to see if somebody else had done it, there have been ideas I stopped and I didn't do. I never even got, you know, it saved me that expense because another gardener had shown what happens. And I realized, oh, that's a problem that can happen with that idea. <laughs> so it's very useful. So, you know, people are combining their information and condensing down what's working the best. And so that's kind of what is super exciting about this class is we have a chance to show you some of the things that that we found that worked the best for us, uh, and we are certainly not the authority, but for us with our experience so far, these are things that are good for new gardeners and some old, older gardeners too to, to know that can be useful and potentially save you time and money and hassle. <laughs> so, all right, that's just who I am. So now we're talking about sweet potatoes, and um, for those of you here last time, um, we talked about sweet potatoes ha having an interesting characteristic. Do you plant them the way you would plant a normal potato? Do you remember? A normal potato, you just dig it down into the ground, six to eight inches, and it will come up. And in about two weeks, you'll start to see shoots. And for me at my house, I need to cover them with something because the beetles will get to them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of you have any problems with that. Be, but Last year, I didn't. Uh, we're in a new spot. Um, but last year, I didn't have any problem with the beetles. That would be wonderful. But. So I do have to cover mine to keep them from getting in. But then I, they pretty much go all season until they die and look terrible. And then you wait two weeks, and then you harvest, hopefully on a dry day after it's been dry for a while. But sweet potatoes, you don't do it that way because they are actually part, like part of the morning glory family. Okay? Um, and yeah, I don't know if you can see it kind of with the leaves and stuff. You have to sprout them off of the potato, and then you take cuttings and stick these in water, and they will form roots. And those are the ones you plant. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty hardy. Um, I don't know, has, who has grown sweet potatoes? Has anybody here grown sweet potatoes before? Okay. So they, have you grown a lot of sweet potatoes? I've only done it for three years. Okay. Yeah, I, I've grown they, it before. They but say that they're soup. The, that the vines, you know, you'll get them in the mail sometimes. If you order them, you'll get yeah, the, you'll get the starts. And sometimes they'll come and they'll look horrible. They'll look, you know, they'll look like they've got mold on them, and they'll be practically dead. And they say to still plant them. And I've done that, and I've found they they re, they they do a fine. Mm -hmm. So I don't know at what point they would not do fine, but <laughs> they're pretty, pretty hard. hard to kill. I've been told they don't actually have to have roots on them when you stick them in the ground. But I like to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so what I'm going to show you is the next step, which is how do you turn the vine then? A lot of people don't realize, a lot of people, like if you go to YouTube, they'll just say break it off and stick it in when it gets like four to six inches. <laughs> But what a lot of people don't realize is you can, um, and Donna was telling me she's got this big, long growth. So <laughs> what I like to do is I look down the plant. I'm looking at these nodes, okay? You want, you want at least two leaves, two to three leaves above. And you want, and do you see this longer section of node? I'm going to cut just below here, but right above this other node, okay? 
Because this, I don't know if you can see it, but do you see this little, where tomatoes have suckers, This see that little sprout? That's another one that's going to grow out of there. And it's going to form one of these. You see it? Yep. All right, so notice this is milky. That's why I got this. So then I'm going to take these bottom two leaves off because if, and there's, a, there's a little baby leaf that's starting to come from that node. Okay? So, and then you're going to, because if you put the leaf in the water, it will mold. So you want a couple nodes below the water because those are going to be where the sprouts come from. You know, and then you can just keep going. I always leave a little bit. Okay. And you want to make sure they're below, that's below the water. But it, it, uh, those roots will start pretty soon. Now, if you ever are in a situation where, like, say you've done all of that and they've rooted and you have a few more you want to take off and you're taking it off down here, right, the part that's touching the potato, it's really important. Uh, an old farmer I was watching on YouTube mentioned it, and he's the only one I've heard mention it. But they said you should take an inch between... If you pull this off the potato, like a lot of YouTubers do, and then they stick it in here, you should cut at least an inch of that, of what was close to the potato, off, because that can carry disease, potentially. So a lot of people don't realize that. I thought, oh, okay, he's somebody who'd been doing it for decades. So if you do take it off of there to stick it in here, cut that, that one, at least one inch off. So yeah, I'll do another one here. I can see that there's going to be a ton of potatoes. Here. You are. You, you pretty much have, depends upon your space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's going to be a ton. And um, I'm just going to tell you, I mean, I'm going to get into it over here, but with the sweet potato, the easiest way to grow sweet potatoes this year, if you want, is, and you're going to need an area where th these will grow, the vines will just go wild. They'll go crazy. Um, I will tell you that deer like these, and um, I believe groundhogs like them. Mm -hmm. So if you have a way to, if there's a way to keep that away, because they will munch them down a bit, I mean, you still might get some, you might still get some sweet potatoes as long as you've got some green. They say um, that, um, you know, that Asian cultures like to eat this part, this leaf part here. So it, look that up and see, but for sure, but I, they, they, they use it like a stir fry, like almost like a spinach or something. Yeah, and they use that in their cooking a lot. And I haven't it, done it it's, yet. It's probably, I mean, even when you have them growing like crazy, it's that leading end, you it's know. It's not the, the vine, tender it's, the, it's part. this part, mm -hmm. just the leaf stem part. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, so then you can, um, when I first started, I just, um, I took an area that I had um, already like covered, so it had died, everything below it had died. But you could like lay down um, uh, something to smother, and I'm gonna talk to you about that in more detail. And then we did a deep bed of compost. And, um, and then we, we, after it had, you know, it had been there for a little bit of time where the weather kind of had, so it, it condensed a little bit. Then we planted, and you don't wanna, you don't wanna plant these until like sometime in June because mm -hmm. the ground has to be at least 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. They love heat, and they're more in tropical. They're not really... And you do want to get them in as soon as you can within the range because they need time to grow. Mm -hmm. But you'll be surprised how much you get as long as these leaves are growing. <laughs> Something's <Yeah>. not eating them. <laughs> Peppers and sweet potatoes. And they're potatoes. delicious. The thing to know, though, about sweet potatoes is they're not delicious when you first harvest them because they have to go through a kind of a... The sugars have to convert in them. And so that takes, the, they usually say you need to be in high moisture at 80 some degrees to get them to uh, do that. But I've had them in my foyer stacked in crates until I was going to take them down. And they did okay just over time, longer mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I haven't found a place in my house to do high moisture at 80 some degrees. Right. Although I've seen it's people hard. do it on shelves with plastic around it. Oh, could be. Like a heat mat and heat lights. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, they, that they'll, then they'll get their sugars and they'll taste good. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, they're like a, just a regular starchy potato. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little disappointing if you're expecting sweet. But the neat thing about sweet potatoes is they are considered a superfood, and they have a lot of nutrients in them, and they're, they, they don't have much pest pressure or disease pressure. I mm -hmm. haven't come across any for me, and um, I don't know of you. And in this no. area, they say we don't mm -hmm. really have too much. Yeah, it, it, I haven't done it in the last 
couple, three years, but before that, no, I didn't have any real trouble with it. Okay. Okay, so, um, and this is her... One of my basement um, bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Which we're not her using. Her store of sweet potatoes. <laughs> and that's only part of them. I mean, off of a 25-foot a, a section, I got... It was probably, at the start, we were up here. Wow. And I, I left the bottom one with nothing in it in case there were mice or something. Um, but they ha I haven't had problems. And then, but you store them on newspaper... Um, and the, you know these are really helpful. Sometimes greenhouses will give these to you mm -hmm. because they they get them when they get their plants to sell. Mm -hmm. um, and my potatoes are here. And then I have on this side I have more. And then I had two layers in my foyer wow. <laughs> off to the side. Wow. So they're they're wonderful and they give you some so much good food in the winter time and they're easy. Right. So I want to turn more people on to sweet potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's a really good question. You get them, say you like a sweet potato that you have in the store, you can get them that way. Or you can order them online at a potato place, like Maine Potato Lady is one example. She has good potatoes, seed potatoes, and sweet potatoes. But you know what? You could get them um, at a store. If, like you go to an Asian market, or you could go to, if, you, if there's a favorite kind that you really like a lot at the store, you could use it. But they do say that, or if you can, try the organic mm -hmm. because they can be sprayed with something that helps them not throw up their, you know, sprouts. Okay. Yeah. And, and I bought these from Trader Joe's. And they were the white kind, you know. That's one I really liked. Um, that's the only one that came out, but... I'm not complaining. If you waited long enough, they might start doing something. I don't know. know. They, no. they don't look like this. But that's the other thing. You can put them in water and sprout them that way, suspended on toothpicks. But I've found they go faster in soil. And I've, I've seen people say that also, that they go faster in the soil. You have to be real careful. I, you see I have about that much soil in there. You have to be careful not to overwater it because you don't, they don't like sitting in the water. They can you spoil. Know, they will get kind of mushy and you know, mm -hmm. rot. And so I just was very careful how much I watered them and having enough at least an inch below where they're sitting so that, because I don't have holes in this. So, so that the water had a place to stay away from them, you know. So yeah, some people will say put some little tiny pebbles or something in the bottom. Yeah, you can Or do even that. sand <coughs> allows it to wick away. Um, it just depends. I didn't do that with mine either, but mm -hmm. you can put it on the... Also, if you want to speed it up further, it seems like it went faster when I put it on my freezer, top of my freezer, where it's warm. Have you ever noticed yeah. sometimes your freezer is warm? <laughs> yeah. And that's a great place to put any transplants that you're growing to before they sprout. Once yeah. they sprout, you want to get them under lights. Right. But so, I'm uh, sorry, I'm going to yep, move go on <laughs> because we have so much to go through. So, um, I wanted to touch real quickly on container gardening. Um, our, our whole, um, we're, we're talking about garden planting and, you know, preparing the soil, garden planting, um, of both direct seeding and um, transplants and some trellising today. So um, for container gardening, um, you're going to want, and if you watch, you have in your handout, I'm sorry, usually I have um, really good uh, PowerPoints with all the stuff on it, but I'm struggling with an eye problem right now, so <laughs> I didn't have as much time to try to prepare. Um, so anyway, in your handout, you have a lot of this. Uh, you want pots with holes uh, for drainage, um, or also the fabric. Can you hand me one of those? <coughs> um, that's one thing. You have to have drainage when you're doing containers. Um, but I got this at Flow and Grow over by um, Rilking across from Real King, and this was about $4. It's very, very inexpensive. This is a five-gallon five one. 
Um, what I did read, uh, or I watched a YouTube, and she used a 20-gallon container for a large tomato, you know, the indeterminate ones that keep growing and growing. And uh, so it was a large pot, but she could put some basil, uh, a uh, basil or two and a marigold plant in there and it was nice. Yes? I put my tomato in there last year and you have to prop it up. Too. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm sure, yes. Um, somebody said, my daughter said that she put her tomato in this and it, especially the indeterminate. If you get a determinate tomato that'll only grow so far, you could probably stake it and it's gonna be okay. But the indeterminate, they grow and grow and grow and you're gonna have to prop this up somehow, you know, against uh, the side of the house or whatever if, if that's where uh, you're getting enough sun. Um, <coughs> but anyway, um, the thing about these cloth bags um, is that there's air can get in, or w once they grow out to the edge, the roots are air pruned. So, you know, they're not going to go round and round and round and uh, get pot bound, but they're going to stop there and then they're going to take another direction, you know. Mm. And so that works out really pretty nice for those. See if I can do it. anyway, I'll Got do it. that later. <laughs> okay. Um, those bags are useful. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Three years of mine right now. Okay. It's a good idea to make sure you clean them out at the end of the season. So the question is, you know, are those bags reusable? And yes, uh, you can leave the dirt. I put mint in it. I'm not changing anything. Yeah, that's a good idea. <coughs> you know, mint, mint is over. one of those things. You don't want to put it in <laughs> with your rest of your garden. It's going to take over. But I put mine in that, and um, they seem to be doing fine. Um, okay, so potting soil... Um, you can use a vermiculite or perlite, a, a coarse vermiculite. Um, what, what's that? This is coarse vermiculite. This is the clamshells. Oh, okay. Calcium. Yeah. This is coarse ver vermiculite. You want some of that. Vermiculite will help absorb the water and stuff and, and um, make sure that it doesn't get too dry in there. Um, and uh, you'll want, uh, let me see. Oh. Uh, Melody suggested uh, cardboard boxes could be used too, but that would be kind of in your garden area. You could dig down and put the cardboard box and put some wood chips around it to kind of support it and stuff like that. Yeah, for I was my. It, it's a thought I've had, and I saw somebody else doing it on YouTube, I, but they don't have the result yet. But I was thinking a cheaper way instead of that. Although I like that it, it looks nicer. But if you don't care, you could try. <coughs> uh, you know some cardboard boxes, whatever size you want. And I was thinking that if you put them down in the soil a little bit, that you might have to, the, the problem with having anything raised, a raised bed or something like that, is you have to really be on top of it with water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if you're somebody who's water too. challenged, like me, <laughs> I'm always, because <laughs> I forget, you know. Um, uh, they do better <laughs> if I do certain things. I'm going to tell you some of the stuff I do. But one of the things I thought that might work is dig them down into your garden bed, like maybe three inches so they're getting some wicking moisture from the soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if you surround them with some wood chips, which help hold that in too, that you might be able to get by with less watering yeah. and still have the benefit of the self-pruning. So, um, yeah, you, in pots like that, containers, you want to use a potting soil with vermiculite or perlite. Uh, vermiculite is better to help retain water. Um, worm castings or um, will give it... Uh, more nitrogen. So you can buy the worm castings, um, and that helps with nitrogen. Um, and also an organic fertilizer, and then sometimes you need some calcium too. Um, she also has some alfalfa pellets. That's what I like to use for nitrogen. Uh, one of the main ones I use, cheap, horse feed. Yes, <laughs> horse feed, and I just got a big Yeah, and calcium thing of it. is the clamshells. Yeah. And the clamshells would be the calcium, yes. Um, so uh, the thing is, containers have to be watered almost uh, daily, at least, uh, pretty much. Um, 
unless you have a good one like she did with that you can water it has a reservoir to water it for the week I would, there's one other thing with the containers <coughs> you know i like wood chips for a lot of things but if you put wood chips like a two inches on the top of your container mm -hmm. that also helps it it keeps the weeds out and, but which isn't too much of a problem when the plant grows but it also helps with water right it doesn't wick away as fast so right uh-huh evaporate as fast um but to know when you need to water stick your finger in the soil you know if, and just see if it's down a little bit if if it's still moist underneath there and if it's not then it it needs more watering and um, you also need to fertilize them or feed them some way with alfalfa, uh, alfalfa pellets or something like that probably about once a month you know because you're watering it more and kind of diluting it okay um, we're going to go through raised bed gardening really quick um, how many of you does anybody do raised bed gardening okay <clears throat> um, so raised bed gardening, uh, one of the uh, formulas that I have seen uh, for that, is, uh, for the soil, would be uh, equal parts of peat moss, compost, and vermiculite. Okay, um, the coarse grade, of course. Um, and when you're making the soil, it's better to use a mask, you know, because a lot of the stuff, you know, it gives off um, it, fine particles, um, which aren't good to breathe in. And um, one of the downsides of raised beds um, is they also uh, tend to lose um, water, you know, they need watered more regularly. Um, but again, you can put the wood chips on it to help it, you know, on the top of them. Um, and sometimes um, if you have a higher raised bed, in fact, we had about 18 inches because I used pallet, pallets and I cut them, <laughs> and, you know, used the boards like that to, to uh, build my boxes. And um, so they were about 18 inches tall. And first of all, we just put some old wood in there, you know, tree branches, whatever, you know, stuff like that. Um, the more, um, the older they are, <laughs> uh, the better, really, you know. Yeah, you put them on the bottom before you fill the rest of the bed. Right. And they, they'll hold moisture and they'll provide, like, wonderful fungal, which a lot of the plants really like. And they look nasty, but when they're old and pithy and falling apart is like when they're really great. Right, and and we had a big pile of leaves that had been sitting there for two or three years, you know, and we just scooped that in there, you know, and grass clippings, and, you know, then we put the dirt on it. Yeah. And it worked out pretty good. Of course, as that stuff settles down, you're going to have to put a little more dirt on it, you know, but it does feed it feed the bed pretty and it's cheaper to it's a fill. way to fill it up <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, that is called hugo culture yeah okay pretty cool you oh. can use your regular dirt then on that and then you put your specialty dirt on top of that right so right you're, you're not wasting it too much. Uh -huh. and and then put some compost on it or yep. you know something to feed it uh amend it with with word castings or um alfalfa or whatever Calcium. you're going to use um, okay, now we come to in-ground gardening, which is Melody's specialty. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing a form. Mine, I wouldn't call it raised bed, but it's soft-sided. I've had to do, put all my dirt on top because I have a place where they used to have greenhouses, and it's all sand and pea gravel. <laughs> of course, the the weeds and the you know, stuff are coming up through it, but uh, which we mow. But, um, you know, I just didn't feel it was going to be very good. So I put um, about eight inches of dirt in my, uh, you know, beds of that. So, but she has a lot of good information on this. So, I'll all right. Her. So, um, if, if you can't see over this, just let me know. I'll take it down again. <laughs> um, so, there's a couple of things I'm going to talk about first. The first one is, you know, how to, how to start from scratch. Um, how many people are using existing garden beds or will be starting from, how many will be starting from scratch if they, okay. 
starting from scratch, starting a new garden bed from scratch. I usually go with seeds right in the garden. Okay, yeah. So, and that's another way where, um, yeah, there are certain seeds that do really well that you really do much better doing in the garden. So I'm talking about starting a bed that you, that like over grass, like, you know, or over something. Yeah. Okay. Cause I'm going to talk about that first. I'm going to go through that fairly quick cause I need to catch up some time and then I'm going to review it again when I go over how to, you know, what, to, what I like to do with my beds when I open them up and get them ready for the season. Um, and then, and I'm sure you guys have ideas too. So, and of course, if, I love to hear people's ideas because when we get together as gardeners, whether you're somebody who's real experienced or somebody who's not, it's amazing how many ideas you come up with together and then you get better as a group. So I love it. So um, first of all, let me just talk about one question somebody had. What is the difference between dirt and compost? And that's an excellent question, actually. Um, so, you know, you've got your regular topsoil you know, that is basically right under your grass, okay? And there's what? Usually about six inches, if you're lucky. <laughs> so, and then there's compost. And compost is, it's basically biodegraded um, leaves and, um, you know, kitchen scraps. And you might have, um, like, somebody might throw some hay in, some brown things like that. And it's just really much more nutrient dense and much more rich. It's usually going to be a really dark soil. Okay. And there are, you don't, always, you don't have to buy this from a garden center. In fact, you might get better quality if you get it from like your local municipality. You know where I'm talking about, where they, where people take all the the leaves and branches and leaves that they chip up as they go down your road, and and the leaves, and they take them and they discard them at these places, and then they often will compost them down, and the microbiology heats up the pile, and it and it just eats it, and as it's eating it, it heats it, and it turns it into this beautiful soil because they'll they'll turn it, and yeah, it, it's and it's free if you load it yourself at a lot of these places. If you take a trailer, and they might, like ours, the one that we go to, will charge you about $4 a yard, which is like a stove, you know, mount. So it's way cheaper. <laughs> and we take not this, but we take, you don't, it, it, that could get a little pricey too, but we take bins like this, big ones, and we fill those. So you could put those in your car and haul them home, you know, depends on how much you want to lift. <laughs> Um, um, we even do that into our trailer. We started doing that because it was such a pain to just take it out of the trailer. So we could just, we'd go, fill it up. It can fill it up so fast, come home. The two guys grab it, take it out to the garden, dump, or throw it in wheelbarrows and dump. Yeah, it is. Are you on? It is cheaper. Am I on now? Okay. Um, it is cheaper when you, you don't pay anything if you, Shovel it yourself. Right, and the one we have has a 24 hour, so you can go into the main area, or if it's off hours, say later, you work later or something, you can go out, and as long as other people haven't gotten to it before you, you'll still have a pile out there. And they do uh, compost, and they do mulch, which is wood chips, aged wood chips. So, um, and I'll just tell you about the mulch real quick because I'm gonna go through this other, and when I'm talking about it, this will let you understand a little bit. So aged wood chips can be very useful on the surface of ground. Um, you never want to dig them in, you know, rototill them in or anything like that. And if you're going to reuse them, you want to rake them back, plant, then I usually use new aged wood chips right by the plants. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that process. Um, that way they don't get mixed in um, because they can steal nitrogen from the soil if they're in the soil. Now, a little bit, not a big deal, but they, so they should stay on top. But two inches of wood chips around your plants can make your gardening fun again, okay? Because they do the things, what is the thing we, what is the thing that we, we don't like about the garden? If it wasn't for weeds, right? <laughs> Most of it would be a lot of fun. So um, what it does is, you know, like once I've planted that plant, I throw those around there and it holds the water and it really reduces weeds. Um, they will come up, but when they do come up, you know, you it slows it down so you can get to it, you know? So there's fewer, and when they come up, you can pull them as they come. And wood chips have an amazing ability because they keep moisture. Um, they 
the soil is so develops a softerness over time because the microbiology is coming up and doing things in there. And I took a micro uh, I took a permaculture class once. What well, was fascinating, but one thing I learned was there's so much more going down in, going on in the soil than out of the soil. There's so many interrelationships and pathways and interconnections and chemical signals. It's just amazing. And they actually, they cooperate a bit and they, they share nutrients and they, it's just really cool. Which brings me to one of the other things I'm going to talk about. I follow a, a no-till policy and you'll find on YouTube and with market gardeners that more and more of them are tuning into this because we're finding it is much more beneficial. Um, you know, people rototilled and dug up their gardens for years, but it's actually better not to do that, and I'm going to tell you how not to do that. And the reason is, is think about it. If you've got pathways that are established, the worms and the microbes, and then you've got the mycorrhiza and the fungi, and it's going, and there's pathways, and they commit chemically, they do communicate, like, like if it needs something. Sometimes they can share and borrow. So if you tear that up, they've done studies, and they found that it can take at least a year for it to recover. So all that microbiology that's going on is actually helping that plant thrive. It's getting it its nutrients. So you know, we put nutrients into the soil and plants don't necessarily be able, are not able to necessarily use them like that. It's the microbiology that breaks them down and chemically makes them easy for the plant. And which is another reason why, generally speaking, it's a good idea to get away from um, uh, chemical fertilizers because they, don't, they actually harm the microbiology in the soil. They give the plant only key things. Not, it's kind of like eating an apple um, versus something that's like apple juice. Okay? An apple has all the packaged nutrients exactly the way that's perfect for our body. But if you have a little piece of this out of the apple and a little piece of that out of it, or like you know, orange vitamin C instead of the orange, you know, it's not going to be as bioavailable or as perfect for us. You know, you're still going to get vitamin C, but it's not going to be in the best packaging for the body to use it. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like that for the microbes. If you use on you know non-natural forms of fertilizer, they will work, but not they, they will work for a time, and then the soil will be depleted and the microbiology gets harmed. And, if the, um, and so really what we have to do as gardeners is we have to feed the microbiology and make that happy. Because if it's happy, it, ha it affects, it, 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 it makes the plants be able to thrive much better and it also can take out some bad things that are in the soil. Because if there's a lot of little hungry things there and you've got a little you know, grub down there that's not a good grub, you know, it's more likely to get taken. So it's really cool. Um, we, we have to support that soil, and if we do, it makes a difference. So we don't really want to be digging it up. So then the question is, if you can't dig it up, how do you get a garden going? Okay, so it does take a little bit of time. So like your first year is not going to be as vigorous. Your second year should be a little better. By the third year, it should be coming in line. And they say by the seventh year, things should be very on track, as long as you haven't use you know, the unnatural things and you've done some of the things I'm gonna to talk to about. So um, when you start a bed fresh, uh, you pick an area ideally that has the most sun that is not too low where it's gonna be soggy um, and is close enough to the house that you're gonna be able to see it. Because one of, the, one of the keys to success for a gardener is to be able to, you should be checking it every day. Just get in the habit of going out there. It doesn't take long. Just check, because you'll be surprised. Things will happen. Something will dig something up, or you'll see a disease coming on that you can just clip off. It's not a problem then. Or you know, some aphids on a leaf. Throw it. You know, um, where instead of having them. So and then watering, and you can check that too. When you know uh, the watering, you'll you'll want to stay on top of that, of course, too. So, but you want it's helpful to have it somewhere near the house, but it has to be as much sun as possible because the sun is what gives you really good fruit production. And I, I think of a lot of plants in the garden are fruit, you know, like tomatoes and things like that, anything with a flower. Um, it, needs, it needs sun. It's going to give you better sugars in it too. So if sweeter, nicer tomatoes and things like that. 
So for me, I'm in a slightly challenged location because I live in the woods, but it's pushed back a ways. But my, my tomato plants still s really stretch for that light, and that's why I trellis. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that too later. So, okay, so when we start a bed um, on where, the, you know, that has never been uh, gardened before, you want to, um, first of all, you know, take a look at that section. And if there's any really tough, nasty weeds, those are the ones you want to get out. And I'm not necessarily talking about grass, because grass can be ma managed by, su by suffocating it, basically, keeping it from the sun. But I'm talking about, you know, the big, deep-rooted ones. It's worth digging those out, because they have enough energy in those roots to punch through landscape cloth, OK? So take a little time, figure out where your areas are, and then you want to dig those out or get them out. It's worth it. And then once you've done that, you can, grow, you can mow that grass really low, OK? Um, and then usually, after you've done that, you're going to mark out your areas, like you would normally, your pathways and your rows. And I would suggest, you know, for, for if you're a new gardener, um, I would suggest that you start small. It's always good to start with a, a smaller, like, um, a smaller garden because then you can stay on top of the weeds and have more success. And the other thing is a lot less expense with experimenting because there's so many things. You're always going to learn, you know, new things, and you'll realize that didn't really work. You know, I went through several different gardening methods before I ended up with what, I, <laughs> what I'm doing now. And you, and you still learn. You're still like, oh, that was unnecessary expense. Or, wow, that didn't work as well as this did, and that was less expensive. So, um, so basically, um, you're going to do your rows. I would, I would start with something as simple as, like, um, you know, people oftentimes will do a single row. But um, one thing that you, I would encourage you to consider is, like, a 30-inch wide by maybe an eight or 10 foot long to start with, um, unless you're really going big. But I would highly recommend if you're starting, that you start small. Um, and you could do a couple of those, you know, um, just a little bit away. Cause, and then the back one, you might want to trellis on the north side or whatever. Because um, you can always turn a small garden into a lot more productive if you trellis. And then what, when you're trellising, you're not having to worry about surfacing as much for weeds, right? So you can grow plants closer together, and so you're using your time much better, and then you're more likely to have more success, <laughs> you know, because you're actually going to get out there, you're going to get those weeds, and that's what I was telling you about wood chips. They slow those weeds down, and for a while you won't have any. And so, I would suggest, I would suggest for your rows, uh, walking rows in between. <laughs> At least two feet. You yeah. know, some people try to do a really narrow. Yes. But you know, those plants grow <laughs> together. Yes, I agree. Because, and think about it. Imagine yourself, um, one of the neat things about ver vertical gardening with trellising, you don't have to be down on your feet, at, on your knees as much. But you always have to plan, could I get a wheelbarrow through this if I needed to? Um, could I kneel with my feet and without, and, and uh, Martha's absolutely right, because you know, you know how it is. We're always thinking tomatoes are not going to grow as big as they grow. <laughs> we always try to get them closer than we should. Like three feet. <laughs> yeah. If you're doing normal tomatoes, I sucker mine and I vertically grow them, so you can grow them 18 inches, but you, you have to be very vigilant about those suckers. <laughs> Um, no, it's, tomatoes can grow next to each other, but but you don't want them touch. That's probably where you're getting it. You, it's better not to touch, and the reason is is because it promotes disease, okay. and that's a good point. Um, with tomatoes, you don't actually. This is something else you should know. You don't want to be out in them when they're wet. Don't be touching them because the diseases like blight they transfer with water. So. Uh, if, uh, you can go out there and look, but avoid pulling that sucker that you see right there when it's wet. Because if you touch that plant and then you go to another one, you could transfer that disease. So, okay. So then, now that you've got you get your rows, um, you know, lined up, you know, and you want to have them, you know, straight. That's nice. It makes it easier for everything. Um, and once you've got your your rows and your pathways, so so say 30 inches, which is two and a half feet. And that seems to be the, 
the size that a lot of gardeners are going to, and market gardeners love it because it's just it's a white it's wide enough to keep have companion plants around each other, which helps shade out weeds, and yet you can straddle the row. Most people can straddle it, you know, to to do this if they need to. So. Um, and then, you know, however long you want. But like I said, if you're completely new or, or even somebody who has a lot, doesn't have a lot of time, I would start small. And it's far better to do well in a small area than to be overwhelmed and just give up, which is easy to do when the weeds, like towards the end of July and you're busy doing things and you're starting to harvest and you're, you start to lose control of, of the garden sometimes because there's diseases you've got, you got to cut them out and you've got to, there's different things and you know, you got to, if it's too big, it's easy to let it, it, it has a problem. So, okay, so you've got that. So now that you've got that, you're going to have, and it's good to be collecting newspaper and cardboard. And nowadays with Amazon, it's not too hard to co collect cardboard. <laughs> You can sometimes get this from recycling centers. There are, there are um, places like uh, certain stores that have larger ones, too, that if you know of any, uh, possibly like with refrigerators or, um, you know, uh, stoves or whatever, that's really handy. But um, I was, the recycling center near us, they actually didn't want to give those up because they have a pre amount that they send and they've already contracted to do that, which is surprising to me. But a lot of places will just give them to you, or you can save your own. You want to open them up and make sure that you've taken off any tape. And if they are um, like very bright colored, you don't want to use them. If they've got a lot of paint and bright colors on them, um, same for newspaper. The part that's really shiny and, and got a lot of ink and color, and that has more chemicals in it you don't want to use. So um, if, I could get, if I could get a plentiful supply of newspaper, that would be my preference because it contours better to the ground, but most of the time I use um, cardboard. And it, but it is important that you make it wet because when it's wet, it will contour better. And if you don't get a good contour, you don't get a good uh, uh, compression on the soil where it, 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 um, you don't want gaps where the weeds can find their way and have a little space to grow. And uh, you want it almost like, like the, the oxygen and, and it, it's cut off and it doesn't have a really easy place to go. So um, what you're gonna do then is if it's newspaper, you want at least four to six layers thick and you wanna overlap them at least four inches, okay? Because if you only do like this, that weed's gonna go like that. And so, and if you, if you have a lot of little pieces, you might want to make sure you do a lot more. And as you go, ideally you want to pick a day that doesn't have a lot of wind because it's, 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 it's very humorous <laughs> in a sad way <laughs> if it's a windy day. And then it's helpful to have another person if you can because you lay it and somebody else just puts a little bit of dirt on it, okay, or compost on it. And that helps weigh it down. It doesn't have to be the full coverage at first, just a little bit in the middle. Because what happens with newspaper or cardboard is as you walk on it, too, it shifts. And so if you want to get that weight on it and also so that the wind doesn't get to it. And, and I pre-wet my cardboard or I leave it out in a pile and let the rain get it, you know, in a hidden place so my neighbors aren't, you know, bothered by it. <laughs> so you can have the kids do that. You can have them break down the, car the cardboard boxes and pull the tape off and go stick them in a place and weight them down with something so the wind doesn't go, woo. <laughs> so, um, so then you get those and you overlap them and um, you do the same kind of thing. You want at least um, four to six inches. And for cardboard, I do a little bit more if I, if I have enough cardboard because you know, they don't contour as well as the newspaper. So, um, and then after that, it, since it's in, it, it depends upon if it's in the fall or in the spring. Um, if you're really ahead of the game, the best time to do this garden, a new brand new garden is in the fall because then over the winter, all that microbiology eats that cardboard and just starts working in there. And that bed will be beautiful like dirt, just regular dirt by the time you're ready to plant in it. So, uh, but if you don't get to it in the fall, because it's hard to get to it in the fall, because what are we doing? We're harvesting and we're, we're doing canning and all of that. And we get, and then we, we're lucky to get the garden cleared, you know, and to get the scraps out of the garden. But if you do get to it, that's the perfect time to do it. Um, 
you can, um, the other thing you can do instead of, you know, newspaper and uh, cardboard is, if you have time, is you can lay down landscape cloth. You know, because anything that kills the grass and the weeds below it, and it takes three to six months to, to do a really good job. So you could just do that over the year, but definitely pull the big weeds first because they sometimes have enough energy with all that root, like I said, to punch through. So, and that's not fun. So, <laughs> um, and then, um, so the fall, but if you happen to be in the spring, like so many of us would be, there is a way to still have a garden. So you would, um, if you're doing in the fall, you only just do just enough dirt. You could just do dirt. You don't have to do compost, but compost is nice if you have it. A, it could be a small layer just to weight it down. Um, and then you're going to cover it with like landscape cloth. So basically you've created your bed and you're going to cover it because the little kitty cats will come. Oh, thank you so much. You know, <laughs> Or, um, you know, or things will dig. Oh, I noticed there's something here. Let me see what's here. Are there any grubs? <laughs> so anyway, you do want to cover it with something that, that allows rain through and air. So I like the woven um, landscape cloth. Um, you can get this at Eau Claire Fruit Exchange. You might have to order it. Um, there are other places online that you can get it. Um, you can get it thicker. I definitely don't like it so thin that you can see through it real easy. You can slightly see through this. If you can see through it, the sun can get through it a little bit. And that's when you might have some trouble with weeds trying to grow through it. Um, if you get it a little thicker, it can be worth it because uh, it, the, the weeds won't have as much sun to try to get through. But I've still had pretty good results with this. The other thing you have to watch out about this once you're using it in the garden is as things die, um, they turn to dirt. And when, if, there, if you don't sweep these off, when, you, when there gets to be a lot of that on there, uh, weed seed can fall in, and then you get it growing on top. And it will punch through, because it will. The roots. But if you keep that swept off, and you've cleared the bad weeds below, you should be pretty good. These, this stuff can often last, you know, five to ten years. So... The or only, choosing. yeah, um, it, so I do, if it's a new bed, you know, you have to get something that will kill the grass and kill all the weeds. And it could be just this. Okay. If you want to do that, you could do that. You won't have to do that other because um, it will be, it'll look like nice dirt okay. in six months. Just depends upon how much time you have. Sure. So, and it's, I will say that it's not a bad thing to do that. And the, the reason is, is it's worm food. One thing people forget, you'll see some, some YouTubers that have this and, that may, and they need to pick it up and put other things under it. If you leave it there forever, the ground below will become, there'll be very little microbiology. Because if you think about it, we have to feed the microbiology. If we don't do it, it's not going to be there. They're animals too, or creatures or fungi. They need to eat, and that's what they do. They break things down. If there's nothing there, they're not going to be there. So... Um, you can't leave it on for, for terribly long. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, three months, you know, but, or six months. Go ahead. And just to encourage people, you know, if this is your first yeah. year of doing it, don't worry. No. You know, I, I put mine, uh, when I used the Back to Eden Garden, when I first started doing this, I, I put the four to six inches of uh, compost, and then I put um, about four inches of wood chips, pulled them back, planted into the dirt, you know, into the compost. And, you know, that first year, it, it really the first two years, Let's was a beautiful a garden. Yeah. It will grow, yeah. you know, but it, it'll probably grow a little bit better if you have time to do some of this right. stuff. So but don't worry, yeah, just keep do, do it. Most people aren't going to have the time, but if you have the time, this will be less hassle, less money everything. You could just do this down. Um, and, but if you do happen to put, you know, if I were going to do that, I would probably throw some scraps on it and um, might even do some alfalfa meal, but, or like, like maybe uh, chopped up leaves or something that's going to give it food um, because it needs food under there to, to keep the soil happy because you don't want to put a gar put a garden in with the plants and they don't have much microbiology in the soil. So, um, and then this is another kind. It's not my favorite. It's what I started with before I found this. 
but so you'll see this though like at Lowell's you'll find this at Lowell's but it's not you can see it's not very heavy duty it's it's really not very as effective but the downside with this is you have to use if you cut it with scissors if you cut it with scissors you really need to use a you don't want to cut it with scissors you want to cut it with like a blowtorch this something with fire because it melts it and seals it because if you don't seal it you'll have this is woven which allows the air and sun through i mean not the sun the air and wind uh, the air and um rain through um but this will turn into these little strings and then you'll trip yourself and they'll be everywhere so or you can use a i've heard i i just learned about there's, there's something called a heat heat knife or something like that or so um, yeah, so it can be as simple as just lay it down, you know, as long as you kill the grass and whatever's below it, and but give it something under there to eat. <laughs> okay, so um, and then um, when you're ready to plant, uh, um, you know, you're going to pull it off. You're going to. Um, a lot of times, it's nice to put a little bit of compost on top because think about compost. Compost is mulched um, food scraps and. You can, I, yeah, no, underneath it. So, so I would, I would, you would put this, and, and you're going to secure this with something like this. You could put rocks on it or bricks, but this, this will anchor it. These are, you can get these at Amazon. Um, and it depends upon you. I use bigger ones because I've, I've used wood chips so much that my soil is super soft over the years. But if you have really hard, you might be able to get by with lesser. But it doesn't hurt to get because eventually yours will be soft if you do some of this stuff. <laughs> okay, so now um, when we do the, um, so you're going to, so let's just say it's in the spring, you're going to pull that off, it's been protected from the cats, and it should have everything under there should be dirt by now, if it's more than three, three to six months. Depends upon what happens at your place, as long as it stays wet. Now, on parts of the country that are dry, it'll take longer um, to compost things down and to do things. But um, here, it goes faster. So you pull that back, and then this kind of goes to, I'm going to shift a little bit here, to um, what you do with a garden bed that already exists. Because in a way, that already exists now. Okay. So for me, so last year, I used wood chips on top of my garden bed, so now they're there, but I'm not gonna dig them in. So what am I gonna do? How am I gonna get those plants in without causing them to get into the soil? So what I do, um, by the time a year has gone by, those wood chips that were two inches, they're, they're often much less than that because they break down on top the soil surface. So I just go in, um, if I'm doing it in the spring, and I'll just gently, very gently, just take off the very top, just the wood chips, and I'll usually pull them towards the low side of the bed so like if you're on a slight hill, I'll pull the wood chips this way because they're going to be a berm that kind of help that bed stay. I tend to have my beds a little bit, I make them raised by just how I rake them, okay, from the pathways and stuff. Um, so I'm going to pull those wood chips off, and I'm probably not going to use those again because there's dirt mixed in. So, um, so now I, and I've got a nice flat 30-inch bed now, okay, with dirt below it. Um, and usually there's a lot of worms too. So I take a look at that bed and I say, okay, does that look compacted a lot? Do I need to aerate that? And if it looks fine and it's not really compacted, but rain has a tendency to compact things over time. So um, if, if I feel that it needs to be aerated, and often I'm doing it at least once a year, I'll just take a pitchfork and I'll walk backwards. I'll, I'll go down to the end of the tine, just a very gentle, because I don't want to disturb that soil. But yet I want to open up a little bit of air, okay? And just so that when I'm digging in it, it digs easily, and it's not hard to dig. So, and usually it's pretty easy because I've got probably that much soil that's fairly soft. But if your soil is soft and it has no di difficulty with digging in it with your hands, um, you don't need to do that. So I'll take it down to the tine, just very gentle rock back, just enough that it starts to move the soil. And then I'm taking it, and about 14 inches later, I'm doing it again. And I'm walking backwards so that I'm not walking over it and compacting it. And then I might switch and do the other side, because that's only going to get half, OK? And then we get it. And then um, I'm going to get my amendments, whatever I want to put on that soil, because I'm going to also put compost on top of this. It's going to be like a sandwich. 
So um, a new thing of compost, because that has nutrition, fresh nutrition in it. Um, so I'm going to come and I'm going to get these two main ingredients, um, the alfalfa pellets. And I, you can use alfalfa meal, but I like this because it doesn't blow around in the wind. And um, this will, when it gets rained on, they'll it'll look like these little weird logs. <laughs> but I like, to, I like to put the soil on top of it so that creatures don't eat it because, you know, your, your um, probably rabbits and other things would like that and they might dig in your garden. So I just assume they don't know it's there. So I'll just grab a handful of this or, or I'll put it in a small cup and I'll just go like that, you know, and then this side too, like that. It's, it's not, you know, it's not really dense. It's just lightly shaken over it. And then I'll do the same with this. Um, and you can get this at feed, both of these at like feed stores. This is, they'll use this, these clamshells in um, like uh, for chickens and turkeys, you know, their gullet and, uh, and also for their calcium. Um, so, and that's a very inexpensive way that you 50 pound bags and you'll use it for a long time, you know, or you can share it with a friend. Um, you don't want to get them wet like the vermiculite too, you don't want to just have it out there and you have a rain, a little rain. <laughs> Those things you want to like take a portion of it out from the garden. So, okay. Okay, so um, basically then you're going to just um, cover that with maybe half an inch to an inch of compost and um, that way it's all nice and sealed in. And then I cover it with landscape cloth. So I usually do it like two to three months before I plant because I want that all happy in there. I want those microbes happy. I want them waking up. It also warms the soil, which helps the microbes grow. And by the time you take that off, when it's time to plant mid-May after Mother's Day for most plants, um, you know, after the frost, last potential frost, um, there's a lot of, of, of microbial activity and you'll see the worms all over the place in there. Um, and then you just, I do my planting, put them in, you know, get them planted. I do the water. It's really important that you water in your plants because the soil will come and it'll fill in around the roots when you do that. Um, and it's really important because those roots have to be in contact beautifully with that soil to do their best. So I water those in real good and you don't want to wait too long to water them in. Like I've, I've done a 50 foot row before and halfway down, I notice they're starting to wilt. So get that water in them right away as you go and they'll be happier. And then, um, and then I put wood chips around it. And you want aged wood chips. I have some examples here if you guys want to see what compost and wood chips, what I'm talking about, looks like. Aged wood chips that have been aged six to ten months at least. Not the new stuff, because that, that can burn or harm your plants. And you just put it right around the plant, and I, it's about two inches and all the bed. And, and you, So I put my plant in, and I put companion plants in, which will help fill the bed, like tomatoes, lettuce. So... Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you can put landscape cloth down the walkways too. So, so this is freshly done. This is what I did last year. I had to do some new tra trellises last year because I had some new ideas that I like better, um, and from the from the internet. Um, and this is an arch, and I experimented. I even put a little plastic over because I wanted to see what happened with tomatoes if I left it open, but covered it from a lot of rain. And sure enough, this this benefited from the this went through frosts better for a little bit. And the um, you know usually you'll end up with some kind of blight on your tomatoes no matter how good you do, uh, but I can usually make it last all through the season. But this this was, I could I had to stand. On a three, on, on on a three-step thing here, to barely could reach that. So, in fact, this year we moved it down. Thank my my family, my hubby took it over here for me and and bring brought this down because we're gonna bring we brought it down to here. But these are my cherry tomatoes, which I love, and um, and this kept the rain off. And so you see the other ones I didn't do that with. I'm experimenting, uh, but it kept the airflow just fine. And uh, I found that these, these still hadn't had the blight too bad. It, it, just, it was still producing gangbusters all the way till frost, and, it, and the first light frost, it actually made it through some of that. 
so, uh, which is kind of interesting. And I've, you'll see a little difference with mine. I plant in my orchard. <laughs> and this started, oh, and I, I cover my apples like that. But um, that's another class we can do. Um, these are dwarf trees, and I started out with extra spacing because they always say to do extra spacing with trees because they'll surprise you, and I'm glad I did. I wondered, what should I do with all that space? It's, it's waste space. I, I've surrounded it with a fence. I've kept the deer off. And I'm, I should use it, you know. So I started planting in them, and um, I already had the wood chips, so. And I love it, and it's great because the trees also shade. So I strategically, there's a spot past here that I'll put my lettuces because they don't, they'll bolt if they have too much sun. Or you could do cucumbers because I found a lot of my cucumbers like a little bit of shade in the afternoon. So um, you can be strategic with it, and you can enter do and and um, let me think what was the other thing we were at with the planting? Oh yes, so you backfill with the wood chips, and you, uh, sometimes if I feel that the plants have been wilting too much because I neglected them while I was planting them, and I neglected watering them right away. I will also fully water around the plant once they're wood chipped in too. Cause, and sometimes they'll get a little dusty from the wood chips, so I'll, I like to water that off. But um, it's wonderful because unless it's a really severe drought, I pretty much don't have to water again until, well, only I just have to get them started and then I don't have to water again because the wood chips hold it. It's just like a sponge down there. The top two inches, well, one to two inches, will be dry, and they'll, they'll, they'll lock together, okay? And then um, the lower part stays damp and moist very well. And you can go into your garden when, when it normally would be muddy. So wood chips don't allow, really, rarely would it ever be muddy. Um, and, of course, it helps with the weeds, and it has the mycorrhizae, and your fruit trees love fungal forest floor, which is what wood chips are, basically. And you'll see mushrooms growing, and that's a good sign. You'll see this white stuff going through it. You'll think, oh, gross, mold. But it's actually the beautiful mycorrhizal that does wonderful, healthy things for the soil. So it's a good sign. What was the reason for the uh, phosphorus over the... To keep, I, it was an experiment. You don't have to do that. That was just me trying something new. Because I'm, you know, I'm always trying to figure out how do I, how do I, how do I get past blight? You know? For the it's for the tomatoes, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, yellow is like they need nitrogen, but when they're getting dots on them okay. and, they're, and they're getting, yeah, they're dying, yep. not just from normal, right? So I just, I keep those clipped off as they come, and you do not want to go from one plant to the next. You want to be clean about it, and I put it in a bucket, and I take it right out of the garden, and then I can, I can often push off blight, uh, it, slow it down okay. if I do that. People who garden down in the south, um, they definitely put high tunnels or things like that, and they grow their cucumbers and tomatoes and all stuff because it's so moist. They can um, and too hot sometimes, yeah. and they can regulate it a little bit better in they high tunnels. They can shade it. Uh -huh. yeah, the, you can actually, if you, you put I a had, shade cloth. We had over. a summer that was terrible, and I just put some sl shade cloth over like new start plants when you first get them out. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, that is a way that you can, if you have transplants that you want to get out right away, or say you bought them from the garden center and they haven't hardened off yet, and you know plants have to have like about seven, five to seven days where you're taking them in and out so they're getting used to the sun and the wind and the bugs. Mm -hmm. And you can sidestep that I've been learning if you used uh, like a floating row cover or a frost, uh, there's, a, there's a thicker one, I don't think I brought it with, that's like a frost blanket. And it will, it, what it does is it, it takes the glare of the sun and it has a nice little protected environment. And you take it off within five to seven days. When it's, once the roots are going and you see the plant coming up vigorously, and you, you know. So, um, and that's another thing too, you'll find that if you have brassicas, you know, your, your cauliflower, your kale, your, those things that those white and yellow little butterflies like. Uh, if you put this over your, those, you'll actually get some, you won't, they, it will keep them off. This, this is floating row cover. And usually you have to order this, but it's well worth it. Um, and you can secure it in the ground. Um, we usually use, this is like a number nine. And you cut it. Um, here it is. 
It'll come in rolls like this. Sometimes it comes in big ones like this with a thing around it. But you cut them to the length you want, you're, and you have to factor in you need at least 12 inches or more that go into the ground. Mm -hmm. If you have soft ground, it might need to be more because it, it, it will pop out. If you have hard ground, you can go less. But you're going to go like this. And remember, for my place, my brassicas will go really high, so this isn't enough for my brassicas. Mm -hmm. So imagine what it's going to be when it's bigger, because you're going to have to keep it under there until you harvest. Mm -hmm. So you want, as long enough, you want it long enough that you can cover it. And you can you know, put bricks around it, have it down to, to hold it down. And you're going to put these about every, you know, about like that. And then um, to secure it all together, you can take some of this baling twine, which you can get at Tractor Supply or someplace like that, and you can, you know, loop it tight, you know, like a half knot, like that, all the way down, and it secures the whole thing a little bit better. If you can imagine what that's like, several of these tied together. It's like a purloin going across the top. And if you want more, you can do one here and one here. And if you have a smaller garden, you can um, buy that in sheets of about, I ordered mine, um, I think they were 12 by 20 or something like that. So it gives you plenty of room and, and you know, yes. you can have a pretty good, um, it'll cover quite a good area, but, you know, not be quite as much as she has there. Right. Let me just show you this here. Um, I had something like this not here, but over here, uh, just by itself, not the arch, but like this is cattle panel that can go like this mm -hmm. and you can put them together, but you can also take them horizontally and you'll see, uh, where is it? Over here, you can't see it. But if you could imagine a four or five foot, 16 foot long cattle panel that goes up on T post down there, it doesn't have to be that close together for that, but um, you can actually like take this, let's say I would plant like say here, and then I would take uh, my floating row cover and I would secure it here and then secure it here and here. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. With, and you can use different kinds of clips. And I usually just use these for, for this. Because see, you can just do this with a floating row cover. And then I'll take it, whoops, I'll take it at the ground. So I'll do one at the top. And then right at the ground, I'll just come in right at the ground hold it down so something can't get under it easily. And you can do more if you want, but um, that works really well, or you can use it on whatever you've got like that. So, um, so was there anything else I was thinking? Oh, that I'll do another time. Oh, yes, that's great. Uh, we'll do that one. A lot of this information I put, I didn't even uh, cut it down. I gave you all the her information about how to do the rows and all that um, through here. So uh, it's good information. Um, we're going to, let's skip over to, in your handout, it'll be B, in ours it's E. Okay. Uh, other considerations. Yes, I got it. Thanks. Okay, so um, I should just ask real quick, any questions about what we just covered? Because sometimes, you know, I'm used to it, I'm familiar, I might miss a detail that wasn't clear, so. What about using Epsom salt when you plant tomatoes? Yes, yes. I don't do that, I, but you can, and I've heard really good results from it. Uh, and the reason I don't do it is because the other has worked really well. But I may experiment and see, because uh, um, actually I think I did it early on, but I didn't know it was a real difference, but there could be, because I've, I've heard amazing results. Have you had some really good results with that? Let me tell you. Oh, have you? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I had problems when I was doing the Back to Eden Garden, um, I could not grow peppers. They'd grow that far, they'd get yellow, they get, you know, just could not get anything to uh, work with peppers. And so I talked with a, a market gardener down in southern Indiana, and he said, try Epsom salts. And so two tablespoons of Epsom salts in a two-gallon um, 
uh, watering can um, and just spray it, uh, you know, water the plant, not only the plant, but the foliage, mm -hmm. you know. And I did two um, times of treatment, and those things greened up and they shot <laughs> up and they produced. That's great. So it, it was amazing. Too? What? Did you put it in the ground when you planted it too? No, okay. no. I, I was just watering, okay. you know. It was amazing. That's a good I tip. Can grow peppers now. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. So, um, so these are just some basics that are good to just keep in mind as any gardener, but especially a, a new gardener because it's. I'm sure I, I wouldn't. I'm probably. I'm. I bet a lot of people made the same mistake I did. When I started gardening, I was like, oh, I want some of this and I want some of that, and, and you know, I got a lot of things that I don't actually eat. And later I got to thinking, why am I putting all the time into weeding and all of this? Why don't I focus on the stuff I will, that my family eats and that we love? And then later I got to realizing, you know, it's really important to garden, so we've got something in case we had an emergency. I want it, I'm thinking, per, I want, I'm starting to look towards things that are perennial that come back every year if I can. Things that start producing earlier in the season. For instance, I used to be really into the big tomatoes, but then I started realizing that's ridiculous. I have to wait a lot longer to get the big tomato. Yes, I still do a few big tomatoes, but now I'm primarily doing cherry tomatoes because you can still make tomato sauce with those. <laughs> you know, and they're wonderful because they start right away very quickly and they're wonderful to snack on in the garden. You know, so you start thinking like that. And then also the kinds of plants, for instance, tomato plants. There's the determinate kind which grow and then they stop and they harvest all at once. And then the indeterminate kind which just keep growing the whole season until they frost. And so that's a kind of an, a better investment for the location unless you have a, a type of tomato that you love that's determinate, then, then it can be worth it. But otherwise, those are things to consider. Um, and also, um, let's see here, the planting space, we talked a little bit about, oh, maybe we didn't talk fully about that. Because I trellis, um, I don't know if you can see this very well. Let me, let me see. Is it that one, this one? Okay, so I use several different trellising systems. Um, you can keep it really simple, but if you have time and you have um, uh, an interest, um, this is a cattle panel, and they're 16 feet long, and they're like four or five, I forget, is it four or five foot wide? Do you remember? Four foot. Okay, so anyway, I, I got... Um, you can put T-posts down. I like to put T-posts down. And the reason why I don't like these on the ground is it's really hard to weed. Have you ever tried to weed in a fence, a fence line? And so I, uh, I saw this on the internet, and I, I made it a little different. But I love the idea of having it off the ground so I can get through and weed easily. And Because that, that was when I was doing the arches. I had arches. And I used to do those with squash with a cattle panel going like this like that. And that was a wonderful way, by the way, to grow your squash, because they'll hang down straight, which makes them easy to store. So you put them over that and uh, yes. So, um, so that is, I still do that, but I do it for my squash. But guess what? I no longer put them down on the ground. Mm -hmm. They are up on T-posts, so I can get through here, because I was always getting behind on the weeds, because it's hard to get the weeds out mm -hmm. from all these little, you know, if they're on the ground. So, um, so... so I do, yeah, and you definitely need two people for that at least, or three people. <laughs> and, if you're doing, and if you have indeterminate tomatoes that way, they're higher, you know. So you put it up about, I put mine up about 18 inches. And then I was able to um, get, you know, higher, the plant could go higher, yes. you know. And mine go crazy because I don't get as much sunlight. I have, you know, I have an 11 o'clock rise and a 7 o'clock set you know, by my trees. <clears throat> so mine go, tr go higher and they really reach. And my tomatoes last year went over the top of this and I was letting them come back down. But mm -hmm. I, I usually sucker them at least till they get to the top and then sometimes I'll let them go as they come back down. But you still mm -hmm. have to, sometimes they get carried away, so... Um, but you know what I mean by suckering a tomato? Okay, you keep it to one stem. So when they have these little shoots that come out here, you nip those. Yeah. Um. It, it's kind of like here. So um, here's your main stem and here's a, a leaf. 
and sometimes they'll come up right in here, a little sucker, and so if you just pinch those off, then it's not gonna go every which way, and it also gives more um, nutrients to the fruit yeah. that you have. So there's a couple schools of thought. There are some people that like to grow them their natural way because, of course, it, it's simpler. You don't have to do much. But, um, uh, and they think they might be get more production. But some people think, and I am one of them, that if you grow them closer together, but you sucker, if you have time, you can do it this way. You actually get better quality fruit and probably just as much, if not more, because how many people have had them growing the normal way and have a lot of green ones still mm -hmm. in the center and that you don't get to use? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, and the other thing that's beautiful is you can spot the tomato hornworm a lot fast, easier, um, and you get wind flow, and so it dries out faster, so potentially less disease pressure. Um, and and um, you know, and then you, they're growing about 18 inches apart. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then um, for for potatoes, I like to do about 12 inches. I probably do mine a little closer. I don't know how. I, mine is about 12 inches okay. away from me. Rows. I do it in a whole bed. So, and mine are four feet wide. So I do four across, and then every 12 <laughs> inches. So I pack them in there. Yeah. And you know, if you have soft soil, and, and like for us, I like to use wood chips on top still. I know market gardeners don't because they ha they are in a, they're in a hurry. But market gardeners can get by with that because they grow their plants, they, gr they grow their starts six inches. They're big plants. They're hardy. As soon as they hit the soil, they're growing, and they, they grow companion plants. And if you do that, you're, you're covering the soil without using wood chips, and mm -hmm. that can work too. Um, but they also have drip line, and I don't want to do that because the way my house situation is, I can't run water constantly from my, because it will hurt my house. If I, it'll drip inside, and so mm -hmm. I, I would have to be out there with a hose. Yeah. So I do, I, I do like wood chips. I just pull them back. So, um, mm -hmm. so this is another type of... Uh, of um, trellis. This is what I do with most of my tomatoes. I only did, I wanted to try this last year because I hadn't done it with the cattle panel before and I thought it might be fun to have it because sometimes, you know, tomatoes get away from you and you might think, oh, that's a beautiful sucker. I don't want to get rid of it. It's too long. Okay, I'm going to let it grow. And usually that's a mistake. <laughs> but I thought if I do it here, if I do that, it'll have a place to go and I won't have to tie it. And I thought I'd just try it and see what I liked. And actually they did quite well. But normally I'll grow them here. Do you see these little that little, um, it's baling twine, it's this. You don't want to use natural, you don't want to use jute or something natural because it, with the water it will, um, it, it will eventually break on you. It can break in a season, but this won't. And um, I don't reuse this though because uh, it can get, you know, it'll have diseases on it. And, and you might even have some critters that put their eggs on here. So. This is a baling twine. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it comes in an orange roll like this, and you can get it at, like, Tractor Supply. Okay. Not too expensive, and it lasts a long time. Okay. Um, but what I do is I'll just tie... Um, let's see here. Um, so if you can imagine a T-post, and you <coughs> have to have this off, of course, and you're going to use a pounder to get it down, you know, probably most of you have seen these. I just brought it in case you hadn't. <laughs> and you pound that down. I like to use T-posts. We made the mistake once of using uh, electrical conduit like this, and then how are you going to get that out of the ground? <laughs> so um, you know, we had to use the tractor, and that wasn't fun to get a hold of. With T-posts, you can put something here and, hold, and pull it out. And by the way, if you do much with T-posts, these are handy. Because it'll, it'll hold on to these right here. Yep. It's very heavy. They're, they work better than a tractor. I just got one. <laughs> yeah, they're it. fast, and you can pull that thing out of the ground. Go like this, and this uh, connects with, with the T-post, and then you just kind of um, walk um, it out. I do want to say something I almost forgot. Be very careful, though, if you're putting something in the ground, you should call that 811 number mm -hmm. because you will be surprised what's in there. there I'm, out, I'm out in the country, and I still once, not from that, but something else we were doing, went through the telephone line. So <laughs> I was <coughs> sure it wasn't there. <laughs> so um, I'm going to put it away over here. So once you've got the T-post down, and depending upon how high you need it, I need mine 
You, you, want it, you, you want it within reach, though. You don't want it so high you can't reach it on your toes. But, you know, you can get it high if your tomatoes go high. Mine go high. Mine will go 10 feet. I've had them go 14. <laughs> so, but that, I'm suckering, you know, so I'm, they're putting more energy. And they're stretching. Their nodes between the fruit is, is probably long. Yours mommy, doesn't have as much stretch as mine does if you have full sun. You probably, because yours. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you put these on the T-posts, and I, these, are, these are like... Um, you go to the plumbing section of Lowell's or Home Depot or something. And these are the, um, I was looking to see what the size was on these. Is it? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Um, could be that. Anyway, if you go to the website, a trellis to make you jealous, <laughs> they tell you exactly the sizes you need. And he's right on, and he's humorous too. He's I got a lot of good ideas. I, we might not have that website on there, but she probably has it you on, would the, just one, go to, on yeah. the one that you, would go um, to you Google can get by email. And say, YouTube, a trellis to make you jealous. It'll come right up. Yeah. And um, this will go right here. Right here. And then you will take, I brought the wrong one, but you can, it's, a, it's a type of electrical conduit. It's not, it's not going to go in the ground, though, but it's going to go here. And the weight just holds it. You don't have to secure it. And then you can string them together with something like this, but this is the wrong size. But you could, this will clip several of them together on down the line. That's 50 feet. So, um, and then you just tie, um, you tie a little slip knot on here. So, um, let's just do it like this. Um, you know, can you hold that for me, Martha? Mm -hmm. Let's say that this is the electrical conduit. So you're going to do a half knot. Anybody remember your knots? <laughs> <laughs> and then you just do, instead of putting this through, you just pull it through like a loop. Mm -hmm. This will hold the weight of your tomatoes, but at the end of the season, you can just pull it. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. It's a lot more helpful that way. So thanks. Um, and it's a wonderful, simple pretty inexpensive and permanent, or you can take it out if you don't like it, trellis system. And then your electrical conduit, they're about 10 foot. What is that at the bottom? What's that? Excellent question. Uh, thank you. I would have forgotten to tell you about that. Where is my little clip? Those pins, you mean? Yeah, the, you know those little uh, white clip? My head. Not that. There is a white clip. You don't have to use it. You can do a knot if you want to. Um, but you to, when your plant first comes out of the ground, when it's getting tall, I don't, I don't put the plants on those until they get tall enough that, that I know that if, in, if I don't get something on it in the next three days, it's going to fall over. So I'll, once they're tall enough, I'll secure. I'll put this around the bottom. You can tie it. But I like those little clips that they use in nurseries. Mm. Yeah, it's are, are they like a circle and they you oh, just pinch here it? Is. it? Oh. You can get them as you can get them white, but oh. I prefer the black cuz these are UV resistant. These will last multiple seasons. And so what the way you do it, it's kind of cool. So I'm I'm not going to let this touch the ground when I cut it. You know, I'm going to figure out about where I want it and then I'm going to Do you see this piece here? It pinches it, and then you stick it right around the tomato base. And then you can wind the tomato around it, or you can let it go up straight and then just put another one every now and then. So you're not passing that into the ground in any no, way, but can, it's only... No, but some people have done that, but I don't want to mess with the little stick. Right. Right. So you just, as long as you're below an arm branch, and I will tell you with tomatoes, it's a really good idea as soon as you can, as soon as there's enough growth to, to take off the bottom 18 inches of leaves. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll do it as I can, as the plant grows. You want to leave three or four sets of leaves above so you still get, you know, nutrition good enough to the tomato plant. But you want to get those lower leaves off as soon as you can because they're a vector to, for splashed up dirt and the soil, the diseases from the soil. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's another reason why wood chips are nice um, is because it helps reduce that. 
So you're not going to get the soil splashing like that. You still can get the diseases because the plant's coming through there, but it, it can cut down on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, like I said, my diseases don't happen until later in the season, and then I usually can control it as long as I clip those um, the, the diseased lower branches. But, and if you, if you get those lower branches, um, it will help a lot. And then as you, as you, the market gardeners will tell you that as you harvest the fruit, you should be taking the, taking the leaves off below. So if you look at any of their stuff, they've got these naked <laughs> stalks quite a bit up as they're... So it allows more light and more air, mm -hmm. less chance of something jumping onto the leaves, which causes the problem. So, okay. Um, can we go on to yeah. maybe like uh, adding flowers for pollinators? Yes, that's great. Okay, so one good thing is, you know, all your plants need pollination. And so um, if you add flowers in your, around your uh, plants or, you know, at the ends of the rows or in different places like that, um, and it can be herbs, you know, lots of herbs do that, comfrey, borage, uh, things like that, that also can uh, feed your garden. But um, also zinnias and, you know, all those different um, flowers. Um, I'm, I'm even going to be putting um, all of a sudden those little white flowers, um, just the little tiny ground cover almost. Uh, uh. <laughs> it just, uh, it, it'll come to me. But anyway, I, anything like that, any flowers around my, your... My plant. favorites are marigolds and nasturtium because they just keep yeah. blossoming. And nasturtium has a light pepper taste. Have you ever tried it? It's really <coughs> good. My son loves eating it. What is nasturtium? What? Marigolds and nasturtium are, are my favorite ones. Just be Nasturtium. Nasturtiums, and they, they're edible... Every part of the plant is edible with nasturtiums. With nasturtiums. Um, alyssum. Alyssum ah, is a really good, I that one. you know, ground cover, and, and, and they really produce a lot of, uh, the bees like them, but also they help with uh, deter aphids is oh, what I've oh, good. seen. I so I've, okay. I've been uh, starting some plants. Okay. Um, you want me to okay. talk about the three forms of trellising real quick? The what? The three forms of trellising. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're good. Um, so th there's all kinds of trellising ideas, and I'm sure you probably have some of your favorites, and there's lots online too. But for me, the basic ones that I found the most useful are the, um, you know, you ov obviously vertical and arched. Mm -hmm. There's also a horizontal, and I'll tell you about oh, yeah. that. But the... You know, what I've I've liked this this one with a cattle panel I, that that is so good with uh, like your pole beans. Mm -hmm. I had pole beans going crazy on those. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was really cool. You have to you know because of the spacing and even with tomatoes, you have to help them get to this top part where they're going to be supported. But once you've got that, they go crazy. Yeah. And it's really, it's, and they love it. And cucumbers, they went crazy too. Um, they just <clears throat> filled it, you know. And um, so there's this system here with the bar and the tie-ups, the cattle panel or fencing. You could use fencing. It's just not as strong as cattle panel. Mm -hmm. So it may not last as long, but it still could be a cheaper, mm -hmm. you know, you can play with it because getting cattle panel home can be really interesting if you don't have a pickup truck. <laughs> but there are ways. So, um, and then, um, then the arch, arch one I like, I, I, don't, I usually have them not, not as, it's more spread out. And then I, I love putting my squash on trellises like that. Um, you can even do tomatoes if you want. <laughs> but especially squash, I like that way, and, and beans. And then there is a horizontal one, which is, um, there's, like, there's like netting that you can get that has like four inch squares or anything like that. And you can spread it this way, and if you have flowers, they'll come up through it, and it will hold them and keep them from falling over. So that's another trellis system that a lot of people don't think about. But like I have peppers that grow crazy high, and so I've been thinking about doing that this year with that because, you know, it's a pain to have to stack, to you know stake all your peppers. Where does it go? 
Well, you, you'd have oh, it wouldn't be in it. here. It, you'd have to tie it from something. Right? Yeah, yeah, you would. You, and you could stake it and then tie it, you know. And uh, probably I'd put it, and then I would do some kind of a round, like a figure eight thing with some kind of uh, non-biodegradable string, like that, probably. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, I might do it in an open area instead of this. Or you, or you could, pro, you could, you know what? You could use short T posts, and then these knobs. That'd be perfect. And then you would just, you know, have it hook on, um, and and then maybe secure it with some kind of further wrapping. And yeah, if you have something that would would benefit from it, that is a trellising system that um, they use. Like um, I've seen some of that in the Netherlands for flowers. So. It's not hard. Um, <laughs> it, well, okay, you wouldn't do it by yourself. <laughs> I, I have done it by myself. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> Mighty. You, you, put, you put a uh, post in. I'm on. Okay. Oh, you you put a post yes. in first yeah. on one side. I of course have them about four feet of, away from each other. You know, at least. <clears throat> and you put the post in, and then. Uh, and you put both posts in, and then you put one side over here against the post. Uh, it, of course, helps with two people. And then you take this <laughs> other long end, that's holding it, and you bring it around and put it against this post. So the bottom end is against the post. It's wedging it, basically. Wedging it. And this is easier even with two people. It's the easiest way. Yeah. And then, as you lift it up, you pull <laughs> the bottom corner out, and it's holding it on yeah. both sides. Believe me, Lisa Minter and I did figure that out. Yeah. It works so much better that way. Yeah. And I, I should say one other thing, too. I don't think I really then, touched it. Then you uh, tie it with um, zip ties. I do zip ties. So <coughs> there, I showed you the floating row cover. How do you do it with this? Um, when it comes to the potatoes, can you send that down to the potato one? You can also <laughs> do it this potato. way. If you have any rebar, you can stick the rebar in the ground. Just if Is you this ever, one? Yeah, that's it. So those are this high. Mm -hmm. But they really almost should be higher because the, the potatoes go crazy. And that's not normal height for potatoes, but it's because it's a shadier area. Um, and potatoes actually don't mind being in a little bit of a wetter area either, uh, those kind of potatoes. Is that packed you got there? Yeah, this is, this is really thin PVC, yeah, from the plumbing, yeah, yeah, half inch, I think. Um, so you stick the, you know, the rebar in the ground, you know, and then um, this goes right over it. And then you can, you can that, underneath that is, is this. Mm -hmm. This is sturdier and heavier, and it's probably easier on... Um, floating row cover. The only downside is it does not clip as well because you can't clip it with these. You know, this clips really well. It completely holds it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to do, you know, something like this, you know, with a, or um, there are snap-on clips too, but I think they sometimes damage that. And, and it's easier if you have your rebar slightly going like That's this. That's right. So that, so that it, meets yes, the arch. or farther down a little bit, but you don't <coughs> want it so far down that it pops off. But, and it needs to be far enough down. Like if, I, if you have soft soil like mine, I have to go farther down. Um, so. What's You can use this kind. What is it? That's an, that is called ProtectNet, which is fantastic, but it's super expensive. You have to get a large amount of it, and it's in the hundreds. It's but, but I like it because it lasts me years, and I can see through it. So for me, I mean, I may not buy it forever, but this is the better way to go for most people probably. Um, but you can't see through it. You have to come peek, you know. You don't have potatoes in there, do you? I do. Why do you do that? Because of the potato beetle. Oh, so yeah. what happens? And there's, I, a, there's a black beetle too. That, the broccoli. No, but you can do broccoli. That's potatoes, okay. yeah. Do they need pollination? No. Okay, so potatoes don't need yeah, pollination. Yeah, anything that does, no. and you know what? I do this with my cucumbers, too, as long as possible. Uh, with potatoes, with cucumbers, uh, with brassicas, you want that on 
before the plant. If there's any plant, you want that on before the plant. So because things will get to it. So um, the brassicas, that, those little butterflies, they'll lay their eggs, and then you have worms on them. And you can use BT, and you can spray it off, but it's a real hard battle, and you have to do it on a regular basis because every time it rains, I would, I'm just a no-nonsense, don't want to mess with it. I'm just going to floating row cover it. Um, and then check it periodically because of weeds. You know, that's why I have that, because I can easily see, is there a weed problem in there? Uh, but you don't have to use it. It's called Protec. I've Net. heard some people try to do it with um, zucchini and yellow squash to keep the um, vine borer. The, the bores, and, but the thing is, you know, you, you really have to do, even cucumbers, you would have to um, do so, uh, pollination yourself. Right. And so what you do is, um, there are two types of blossom for cucumbers and the others. Um, one is just a blossom. The other one has a little tiny cucumber or a little tiny squash on it. That's the female. The male is the one that doesn't have that little tiny, and so you take the male and you start. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do that. Um, so with cucumbers, um, I I leave the cover on until those until there's quite a few until those are starting to flower a lot. Then I have to take it off, mm -hmm. and I just have to let it go. And usually they end up dying. Uh, be after a while, maybe another two or three weeks after the cover comes, well, once it's grown enough and it's doing enough flowering, uh, eventually those little cucumber beetles that have mm -hmm. the stripes or whatever, the, mm. I've noticed, because they carry a disease that affects cucumbers. But there is a way to deal with this. Um, you can choose plants, uh, and this is where be, do growing your own seed can really matter. You can choose plants that are hardy and resistant to these things. So um, like that wilt, that, that cucumbers are susceptible to. Um, last year, I, I, I made it through most of the season with my cucumbers. Were they hybrid? They were. Sometimes, sometimes your but hybrids are, are um, they're, yeah, more, more grown, hardy. They're grown for that. It can be that, worth doing know. a hybrid sometimes with that. They're developed for that. No, a hybrid is not a GMO. It's just cross-pollinated. A GMO is actually genetically modified, mm -hmm. yeah. And the and you're right. I wouldn't want to mess with the genetically modified because you don't know they could take right. something from something that's not even a plant, right? You know. So there's there's heirloom, which are um, like a variety that has been for like 20, 25 years, you know. And Usually they're very stable. They'll 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 be true to seed every time, right? And then there's the hybrid which has been cross-pollinated. And the reason they say that the hybrids, you, uh, an heirloom, you can, you can save the seeds and you'll get the same thing the next time when you do it. The hybrid, um, if you plant the seed, you might still get a good variety, a good whatever, but it's not going to be true to the one that you just planted right. because it's um, been... Um, yeah, the... If you really like the variety of the hybrid, it's always worth trying to save the seed. And I've noticed that at least I'll often get it one, sometimes two years of fairly close to the same plant. Mm -hmm. um, and some people have found that with a hybrid that they'll still be able to, it almost act like an heirloom, so it's always worth trying. You know, if you find a, a, a hybrid that you like, like there's a tomato <clears throat> that I love and, I, and it's a hybrid and it's a very expensive one, but I always get it because it's so good. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. But anyway, so but potatoes I don't have a solution for, so I cover them. Brassicas I don't have a solution for, so I cover them. Mm -hmm. um, cucumbers mm -hmm. right now it seems like the varieties that I've chosen have been okay, and they haven't di they didn't die last year. Like the only reason they died was because I I I didn't I wasn't pickling them fast enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know I should have just pulled them off yeah. so they could keep going. But brassicas and stuff like that, you know, and they're so not dependent on the flowering of it That's right. to produce the fruit. You know. And I should say something about squash. <laughs> there are squash that do not are not affected much by the vine borer. There's zucchini varieties. There is a vining zucchini variety that is my favorite. If you like zucchini, it's fantastic because it's pretty much impervious to the vine borer. And it also is very resistant to the squash bug. And I think the reason is, is because this thing is amazing. It's got this, its sap is almost like glue. 
you even have to be careful how you handle it because it, it's hard to come off your hands. It gets on your counter, it's hard to get off. But that glue seals it. A bug bites it, mm. it seals. And so um, I, I've even had some of these like split, some, a variety of that that split. But the zucchini that I like, it's called thrombocino, thrombocino, um, and it's a vining zucchini. And you can, you can grow it small or you can let it fully grow. And I've had that thing this high. And, and you can eat it because where are the seeds? They're not down the center. They're at the end. And mm -hmm. so you've got this amazing zucchini. It's tender. It's delicious. And if it gets away from you, it's no big deal because it's going to turn into something that looks like a butternut squash. And then you've got it in your basement for food that you might need if you end up you know, not being able to get something from the supermarket that you want. You know, mm -hmm. and, and it, it gets a little tougher. You, that you do need to cook, but you can still cut it. And the neat thing about that zucchini is you've got this big old long thing. How am I going to handle that? <laughs> well, you know what? You stick it on a back counter somewhere. You cut off what you want. It seals itself. It sits there on the counter. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. <laughs> Well, so it's definitely worth looking into. I want to get going because yeah, 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 we going. have we yeah, really, we kind of we've given you a lot of information, <laughs> but we're also running you know uh, longer than we usually like to. So um, one thing I want to add is um, if you're growing hot peppers and sweet peppers, you want them in different parts of your garden because they <laughs> will cross pollinate and everything will be hot. <laughs> That's not fun. <laughs> Um, the other thing is when you're taking crops out of the ground, um, what we have both seen a lot of people do is, is they're, they're saying, cut them off, don't pull the root. Cut them off, let the root stand there. Uh, like Melody says, it gives more nutrients and stuff for a little while. And then later on, like I've been, I cut them off last fall, but then I've been as I'm trying to uh, plant more stuff, they kind of get in the way. Yeah, and they've, so they've I've already been used now, up, you so. know, but at least... But it, what happens if you pull a tomato plant early, right at the end of the season, but when it's still had some growth on it? That root system is pretty significant, and mm -hmm. you really disturb the soil when you pull it out. Mm -hmm. So again, we don't want to disturb the soil unnecessarily, and they've found that there's exudates. It, it's it's like it seeps nutrients into the soil for two or three days after it dies. It also gives it, and, yeah, yeah, it the breaks down structure. It, it, yes, it gives structure to the soil too. So there's so. more air getting into it. Um, okay. okay, really quick, I want to go through direct seeding. Um, and like you said, Dave and David, um, a lot of times you like to grow stuff in the ground, you know, just seed it into the ground. That's one of the better ways of doing it. But um, so root veg vegetables do better seeded directly as they don't like the roots disturbed, you know. So that's your beets and your radishes and all that kind of stuff, you know, carrots. Um, seed them right into the ground. There have been some people who have figured out a way of, you know, putting them in, uh, in soil blocks and stuff and then uh, putting them in. But, you know, the easiest way is just seed them into the ground. And most of those like the cooler weather. So, you know, I, I planted beets the other day, you know. They'll come up pretty good and they, right. and they uh, tolerate the frost, although I saw 28 degrees coming up <laughs> in a few days. But, oh, no. you know, <clears throat> I think they'll be okay. Um, things like zucchini, cucumbers, winter squash, yeah, you can start those, but um, if you start them any longer than three weeks before you're going to be able to put them out, and those are frost tender, so you have to do them after, well, in our area, they usually say May 15th. I did find something that said for this year, May 4th, but I don't know. We'll see. <coughs> anyway, um, but your... Um, Zucchini, cucumbers, winter squashes. Um, I find that just putting the seed in the ground is just as fast or sometimes faster than yeah. trying to start them. And they grow so fast. They They'll grow catch very up fast. fast anyway. Um, now, uh, short season frost tender plants like um, beans, you know, green beans or even any of the beans, um, sugar snap peas, um, sugar snap peas and peas like the cold weather, they will, you can plant them now. Um, the rule of thumb was, um, 
Good Friday. You know, mm. you, you can uh, plant them and they'll do okay. Um, but those are direct seeded. Um, your things like um, beans, green beans, or any of your... I, I grew black beans last year. <laughs> and this year I'm hoping... I, I grew a pound of them with 50 seeds from that I bought in a package from the store. Nice. I mean, you know, the beans that you cook. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew 50 of them, and I got a pound, just over a pound of beans. So I'm hoping for one whole bed, and I'm hoping for about 10 pounds of beans for me for the winter time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and but those, um, you want to direct seed after frost, okay, after danger of frost for the beans. Carrots need to be direct seeded. Um, they like the moist environment, and so what I've seen people do is they, they're very tiny seeds, so they do them very they might cover them with just a little bit of soil after they put the carrots in and then they'll water them in well so that the soil is in contact with the seed and then they will put either cardboard or even just a piece of board over the row until and they keep watching them until they just start seeing a little tiny bit of green, you know, the leaves. They take it off, and then they'll... But they germinate faster that way. Yeah, we keep their moisture right there. They keep the moisture. They yeah. like the moisture, and they are hard germinators sometimes. Yeah, they but, can be problematic. Yeah. But if you um, do it like that, they mm -hmm. have had really good luck with that. Um, and, but also, carrots, you want to have really fine soil. Um, some people sift their soil or stuff like that because any any object they come to, <laughs> they kind of go <"Wee!"> right. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, now, how do, how and when to water? The, the biggest thing is just sticking yeah. your finger in the soil, you know, and does it need more? And like she has said, put wood chips over stuff as much as possible it helps mulch, keep the yeah. but that's my favorite because it, it 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 doesn't break down as fast <laughs> right so. right um and then you want what's i've heard people use them i i haven't because i've been concerned about diseases and, and like it like the matting, but if you had them really fine, and yeah, you probably could. I have done it. I did it in my, my brassica bread one time, and then I covered it. Uh -huh. And I, of course, you have to put a real thin layer, yeah. you know, but it really did help with weeds and stuff like that, too. And it's help. a natu natural nitrogen source. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and, yes. you know, in permaculture, chop and drop is a big deal. They grow plants just to chop them and just lay them down on things just to help. Mm -hmm. That's one way they keep the weeds out, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really quick before she goes on this I, next I just thing, one thing. Um, yeah. I want you to get out your post survey, and um, you know if you can do that real quick or whatever, um, and we'll take that as a drawing. Okay. I did want to tell you about one other thing that might be of interest to you um, when you mark you know, your tags, like when you're growing your plants. I don't know if anybody else has had trouble with the sun. You've got it in the ground, and all of a sudden you can't read what you put on the tag anymore. And you're like, I wanted to know what that plant was so I could know if I wanted it next year. This will not, this is a, it's like a paint marker. It's called um, Artline Garden Marker. And I found it on Amazon. Um, and if you're, if you're ever looking for something that will not, the rain won't get it, the sun won't get it, it'll be there for years. So you can mark it, it's going to stay unless something takes your tag. <laughs> but if you try to use the permanent markers, of course, you know partway through the season you can't see what you, what you wrote. It's called um, Artline Garden Marker. You, probably, it, it, you could probably just say Garden Marker on Amazon and see it. So definitely a useful thing to have. I like these kind of tags, uh, but the, the straight ones are good too. I had, I got some of these at um, um, that Flow and Grow. And um, what I didn't think till later, they might have some of these markers too. So I don't know. 
slow and grow. Oh yeah, you're right. Probably they do. Is there another? Yeah, you have another package. And then uh, one other thing. It, Anybody who's been working with T-Post probably has seen these, but this is how you get your cattle panel attached to your T-Post too. Mm -hmm. Okay, it'll, it'll hook fencing to a T-Post. It goes around the T-Post, and then you can do it by hand, or you can use this, and it flips it around so that it hooks. Um, and you can go to YouTube, it'll tell you how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is useful for hooking T-Posts together in, if you want multiple T-Posts in a longer trellis. Uh, this kind of thing, it goes around it, and it will hook them together so, the te so that the trellis, the two levels can, of a uh, cattle can, panel, can the two panels can be stuck together. You don't have to do that, but just so you know, there are some other things available. <coughs> okay. Okay. So we're gathering the um, post surveys. I, it's uh, you know what? We're going to need oh, no, your no. name on it because... The, did you talk about the... We're going to need your name on it. The email sign-in sheet? Oh, the what? The email um, Oh, yes. Too. And the sign-up, well, we got most of the people signed up for the email thing. I saw it right back here, so we'll get it. Yeah. Um, if, if there's anything that you want to see, too, come look. I, I have the age, what age... If you ever want to know what aged wood chips look like, that's here, too. Yeah. Okay, um, and she's going to, or we're, we're going to send you out an, an email with this. I mean, she has so much information on yeah, that. It's just, um, <laughs> it's just unreal. Think of it as a guide. Don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> <coughs> a resource, a good yeah, resource. Yeah, to educate yourself more yeah. if you want. So do, okay, do so we know where the check sh checklist, what? where's the checklist at? I'm sorry? The check sheet? Um, for the email? Yeah, yeah. It's right back there behind Did Donna everybody somewhere. get the check sheet that wanted to? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so what we're going to do, I have two of these grow bags, and I have two of these <coughs> um, marker things. So... <laughs> Okay, we have, yep, this one, okay, this one, who did this one? <laughs> and did you, is this yours? I didn't put my name on them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, she okay. gets one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Choose which one you want. Okay, and then we'll do another one. This is Corianne. All right. <laughs> Which would you like? Um, I will do these guys. Okay. Thank you. And then... Uh, another one, because I didn't tell you ahead of time. Is that yours? That's yours? <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> Which one would you like? Okay, <laughs> and one right. more. <laughs> Wait, next time we're going to have to tell them to put their names on them. <laughs> Is that yours? Is that yours? Yeah. Oh, well, it's here. Yay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, well, I hope that this was helpful to yeah, you, yeah. and I, I'm sorry it took us so long, but there's so I much we yeah, gave you. <laughs> anyway, um, Melody, would you like to have a little word of prayer? Sure. Dear Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for the life that you give us. We thank you for the wonderful beauty that surrounds us every day. It is good to be a part of your nature and to be able to be out there watching the miracle of the seed, 
we thank you again for providing so well for us. It, we just water it and give it some nutrition, and it just does its thing, and it's just amazing. It's beautiful. Thank you, Father, for your love and for your bounty. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And uh, Laurel, can you have the uh, handouts? Uh, I mean, the posters and the advertisements. There should be one in the folder. Are they in the folder? Okay, okay, very good. In, in there you'll find um, May is, is bread making, June is foraging, then July is preserving. Okay, so the stuff that you're getting from your garden will be doing in July. Um, and then in October, I think we're going to do another garden one uh, to be able to kind of put your garden to bed and stuff like that. One thing we didn't cover tonight, but if you want information, you can talk to either one of us, is how to extend your garden season doing some uh, greens and stuff like that with row covers and stuff like that. But, but you you're going to have to start it early, like in July or something like that, because it has to grow. But that's all we're going to... It's pretty interesting.